Chapter 8 And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. We have with us our old friend Richard. Richard's back to talk to us about Nibiru. Hey, Dr. Paul. Hey. Yeah, Nibiru. This is going to be an interesting one. This is this is the big one that can cause the end of the world. Yeah. Does it does that have any credibility, do you think? Well, this story's taken a bashing. I mean, it's been around for years and we're supposed to have had Nibiru hit us in 2012, 2013, 2014. Uh, I think we had we had another Nibiru for September just gone uh, this year, and we've got yet another Nibiru encounter March next year. So it's it's a bit of a tricky one, isn't it? Well, yeah. Is it a little bit slow coming in? Is it slowing down, or what's the story with the with its arrival? Well, this is the problem you see because everybody's speculating on this thing and the amount of evidence that's actually turning up on the internet is, is not looking so credible, you know. Um, and it's it's interesting to do a story about Nibiru because um, a lot of people just go ahead and say, to the end of the world, we're going to get hit by this huge heavenly body that's going to come in. It's going to tear off the surface of the earth. It's going to cause untold destruction. We're going to have meteorite showers. It's the proper end times prophecy. So this is this is the this is the end of the world, or rather the end of an era, because this will this will change everything if, if this thing turns up. So I thought we'd I thought we'd look at a little bit of the story behind it, and uh, we'll see if we can find any credibility. How's that sound? That sounds great, Richard. In the past 30 years, speculation has grown amongst astronomers about the existence of an extra planet in our solar system. Uh, astronomers and New Age writers have thought different names. Astronomers called it Planet X for the 10th planet or Unknown Body. Uh, New Age writers called it Nibiru, Wormwood, the Destroyer. Now, Nibiru comes from the New Age mythology and is the name for the abode of the main god Anu. Zachariah Sitchin interpreted the story of Nibiru as ancient fact in his 1976 book The Twelfth Planet and related it to translations of the ancient Sumerian writing. 
The most popular description is that Nibiru would be one of the planets circling a brown dwarf sun called Nemesis, which is part of our binary solar system and is the ancient home of the Anunnaki, Earth's fallen angels. NASA haven't ruled out that our solar system is actually binary and having a twin sun could be less than a light year away. They do say 80% of the solar systems are binary and have twin suns, so it wouldn't be strange if we had one. The sun's described as a brown dwarf by Nibiru writers. It doesn't emit much light. It's very hard to see and can only be spotted at a distance with a high-power infrared telescope like IRAS. Accounts of Nibiru vary from smaller than the Earth to seven times the size. Its orbit also varies depending on who you talk to from 3,600 years to 250 years. The details are all over the place. Disinformation is everywhere. We've got false pictures, fake sightings, possible complete government cover-ups. Now, after Neptune was discovered, astronomers speculated there might still be another planet out there. Percival Lowell proposed the Planet X hypothesis back in 1915 to explain the observed irregularities in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. At first, astronomers thought they'd found Planet X when Pluto was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh, but they realized that Pluto is too small to explain the observed orbital perturbations of Uranus and Neptune. So something's pulling on those two planets. And this all started a new search for Planet X. Let's meet the guy who actually came up with the first set of interesting calculations for it. Uh, this is um, Dr. Bob Harrington. And uh, Dr. Harrington um, was actually the chief astronomer for the U.S. Naval Observatory. We're talking about the American military here, and they're spending money on this stuff. Now, this becomes a bit of an odd story um, because... Uh, Dr. Robert Harrington, he went down there with an 8-inch telescope and he was he was uh, making some observations because he thought that he'd found Planet X. Now, the reason he thought he'd found it were, was because um, the orbits of some of our planets were being messed around with. So we've got Neptune, Uranus and Pluto uh, and they call it um, its perturbation of the orbits. So in other words, there's some large other planet. This is how they found all the planets originally. They, they found the orbits were being messed around around with and they went looking for an object that was messing with the planetary orbits so they went looking for um, another body and dr harrington noticed that we've got a bit of a problem with these other three planets it's an amazing story to begin with yeah yeah absolutely but wouldn't you know it um when he's completing his observations and he sent them off to nasa he, he took a load of films he made uh he made some um, celestial maps. He plotted the orbit of um, Planet X. He said he'd found it. And all those films went off to NASA and were mysteriously never seen again. Does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. And a special one was developed, which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. The, the poison was frozen into some sort of dart, and then it was shot at uh, very high speed into the person. So at, when it reached the person, it would melt inside them, and the only thing would be like one little tiny red dot on their body, which was hard to detect. There wouldn't be a needle left or anything like that in the person. But also the toxin itself would not appear in the autopsy? Yes, so that uh, there was no, no way of perceiving that the, uh, the target was him. Wow, we're really good at killing people, aren't we? We can give somebody a heart attack with a gun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is scumbaggery at its best. Scumbaggery is right. We've got some of these notes, actually, that we can we can put on the website for people to have a look at. Because uh, I, I got all the original Dr. Harrington notes, or um, a report anyway, uh, which talks about what he found. Now, um, so he disappears mysteriously. And um, then the trail sort of goes a little bit quiet. Now, I don't know if you've seen these on the internet before. Pictures. No, I've never seen that, seen that. Yeah, pictures of two suns. Very weird, isn't it? 
Very weird. Yeah, and they've had these. Um, they've had these in mainstream media, believe it or not. Not in. Not so much in the United States. This has been uh, China and Russia have gone with these stories, uh, talking about two suns in the sky. People are taking clear pictures of it, and it's. Uh, it's all very real indicators that Nibiru is coming in to trash everything, and it's nearly here. Now, yeah, this is this is where the problems start because I looked at this evidence, and um, to be fair, I'm going to debunk it. Okay, and uh, just to just to make it even more debunkable, I went outside into my garden and I got a camera and I pointed it at the sun and okay it's a camera phone but um here, here's the effect i get so look at that can you see the extra sun right lens flare that's exactly what a lens flare looks like so unfortunately for us that's a really good lens flare yeah it's, it's an impressive lens flare one of the debunkers came out and he did this with the moon you can actually get two moons if you if you point the right lens at the moon uh you get a, a lens flare off the moon which you, anyone would say there are two moons oh no there's a moon coming to kill us all tomorrow oh no end of the world ah. right. Right. <laughs> yeah and it, and it all goes downhill uh, this one was taken by NASA satellite IRIS. The image is dated 21st of October 2003 and clearly shows us an image of what we think Nibiru looks like. It's the winged disc. Now, the story was about a NASA cover-up to withhold this image from the public. But when you look deeper into the image to see if it's a fake, I read the writing on the right-hand side. Now. IRIS is a solar observatory and it was launched on June 27th, 2013. 2013 that's 10 years later than the date in the picture and iris only looks at our sun um, it's actually called the interface region imaging spectrograph or iris for short and it observes the low level of the sun's atmosphere which is a constantly moving area called the interface region and it does it in better detail than we've ever had before and it takes some pictures like this now if you look at the code on it, which is 2003UB313, that's the code given to dwarf planet Eris, which was discovered in January 2005. So this picture is showing us something which wasn't even discovered until two years later, and it was discovered by Palomar Observatory, which was uh, a team led by Mike Brown. Uh, they discovered it's a trans-Neptunian object. It's 27% bigger than Pluto. It's 0.27 the mass of Earth. Its distance from the sun is 96.4 AU, or astronomical units, which is three times the distance that Pluto's away. So this thing's really far away. We're only one AU from the Sun and you could call this planet X uh, because um, Pluto's called a planet well a dwarf planet um, so if, if we're going to demote Pluto and we demote this one it's not really planet X but it's so far away uh, the best picture we have of Eris is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and it looks like this so I think we can close the book on our first picture. This is a fake. It's probably photoshopped by somebody trying to scare the alternative media community. Now, this is the Google box. Now, a lot of people have said that the image behind there is actually of Nibiru and Google is censoring it. Have you heard of this? Yes, I have. Now, I happen to have a copy of the image they say is behind this black box and being censored. Look at this. That's a creepy looking image, isn't it? That's the creepiest looking planet. I mean, it's scary looking. If you look at everything else out there, looks like, you know, calm, just another day at the office. But that thing is menacing looking. Yeah, isn't it? <clears throat> it's got like, yeah. yeah the, and you see the bits coming off the edge of it. Uh, this is what a lot of people are saying is the uh, the dust trail coming off it, which is the, the iron based dust trail. So this is like iron oxide. Um, and this is uh, this is one of the effects they've said of the iron oxide is when it when it comes swishing by our planet and we get a dose of this iron oxide trail off it, um, it's going to turn the rivers and the waters to blood. So it will make all the water go red. It all sounds pretty terrible, but let's take a look, shall we? Here are the coordinates for the black box, so you can put these in to Google Sky and go there yourself and have a look at it. Now, if you put these new coordinates in 
you'll actually find that the image we were just talking about wasn't hidden behind the black box in the first place. Google never censored it. Now I found out the imagery came from STSCI Digitized Sky Survey, so I went there and I pulled the original plates. Uh, these were made by POSS2, which was a satellite. Now, decades before, they'd taken the same piece of sky with POSS1, which we're looking at. Now, if we set these two up and we do a comparison between POSS2 and POSS1, we can see if anything's moving. Now, as you'll notice, Nibiru isn't going anywhere, or I would be Nibiru, because this isn't. So how about we take a quick trip back and we're gonna look at STSCI again. Now, let's fill in the black box. So this is the data that was missing from the black box in the first place. Uh, some people would tell you that there's nothing going on here, but who am I to believe anybody? It's best to look for yourself. So I pulled the two images and I got them together. So I've got the POSS2 imagery, which is slightly clearer, and POSS1, which is the blurrier older data. Now in the PSS, POSS2, you should find that we can see more because the equipment's better. So if we look at these two images overlaid onto each other, then I invert them, we've got a problem. Now I noticed that we've got 12 stars missing and we've got one major star moving up and down in that image so you can see over a few decades we do have a little bit of movement so it's not quite true when people say there's nothing happening here however i've got no idea exactly where those stars have gone they're just missing which means they've moved quite some distance in a few decades i'll have to come back to you on that one and we'll give you an update in a future episode have you heard about uh, the tunnels that people have been um, have been digging? Yes. There's a map. Look at that one. Oh, this is this They're is all over. yeah. This is everywhere. Look at it. And it's all over the world. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. There's there's a lot of underground bases now everywhere, aren't there? Yes, there are. Now, if you've known about something for I don't know, let's let's give this forty years, something that's going to happen and it's going to affect the surface of the planet, but you have no idea where it's going to land. I mean, some people have probably dialed it in a bit better than us because I mean we're, <laughs> we're we're shooting in the dark here a little bit. So the only way we can really get any good information is by following the people who've definitely got better information than us, and that's got to be expensive, hasn't it? Digging tunnels like that. Right, and they usually don't do it on behalf of the public over here. Although I have heard that in Russia and China, they are doing these massive building projects so that people can be evacuated into them. Mm. Have, you, have you seen but not, yeah, not in the West. Not in the West. Not so much They're for secret. Us. No, no, absolutely. No. Um, the, uh, the Swiss have all got bunkers underneath the houses, though. They're always all right. They're always ready, aren't they? Mm. The Russians have got the Russians have got underground bases to stash people, haven't they? They've got for the for the public that is. That's right. That's right. And China supposedly have massive uh, subway systems, not so just, that people can be taken. Well, not just that. They've got massive cities with nobody in them. That's right. You remember that? They, they said, well, it's because of China's economics that they had to carry on building, even if they're building enormous cities with nobody in. I mean, that wouldn't, that wouldn't make an awful lot of sense, would it, just to build an enormous city? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. No, but rush it along. I mean, you don't want to wait around too much because, you know, if, when people spot that, there's going to be a riot. <laughs> we know that much. That's right. That's right. Yeah, this is and this is a problem, you see, because I mean, you're either you're either going to be talking about seeing something like that, which is going to is going to scare people enough to cause massive trouble. But it's certainly going to scare the elite into going into a bunker, isn't it? That's right. Uh, do you remember the stories um, of all the FEMA trains? Right. FEMA trains to the camps with restraining devices, supposedly. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you don't know exactly what's going to be what's going to be going through people's heads because, uh, you know, all the end times prophecies. Right. Yeah, people are. I mean, don't you think that's going to be right up in people's heads when they say that's what's coming through and we are in the end times. And by the way, we've got a load of diseases coming and then they start reading from the Bible and people start getting a little bit worried because... <laughs> It doesn't say good things, does it, in the Bible when it comes to the end times? 
No, you have to go through a lot of bad things, but it is a birthing. Supposedly, at the end, it turns out all right. Well, <clears throat> relatively speaking, after, you can, well, yeah, I mean, you you've know. got to go through Armageddon and stuff like that. I mean, right, you, know, you have to go through the tribulation, exactly. Yeah, which, I mean, the thing is, when this happens, um, there's going to be more to come. So if people are reading from the Bible, then there's the bad news that um, when this thing comes by, it's going to come by again. So this is where it gets uh, really annoying. Um, it's supposed to come back in five months and do it again. Uh, we, have, we, have a, we have an object that's got a 350 year or so orbit, but at this particular time, it's going to just swing back unless we hit a tail or unless unless there's something following it oh yeah this is this is like a comet tail you know those you know those wing bits coming off the side of it those are millions of miles long oh boy <laughs> it's going to be like someone's macing the planet <laughs> so it's it's going to wow. there's russian troops in the states part of the un soldiers i know well i that, know they've got at least 20,000 russian troops yeah that's amazing Mm. And you you know, if you were going to have a third world war with Russia, you wouldn't have tens of thousands of their troops marching around now, would you? No, you wouldn't. You just and wouldn't, would you? So all this hype that we're, we're, we're defending ISIS and they're bombing the shit out of ISIS in uh, Syria, mm. that's all just theater. I think what was trying to be done in the Middle East is they're trying to work up to third world war because I think I think they want a third world war, definitely. Because, I mean, if we're talking about the banksters here, they finance both sides and war just pays so well. I mean, it's great for them. It's, it's, really, right. it's really good for business. And look at the military industrial complex. They get to sell loads of weapons. And times aren't good at the moment. I mean, if people said that the economy is recovering in the States, I mean, how many other people would say that's just a massive lie? I mean, it, it's not looking right. great. You know, it's the stock market's right. been blown up again by the banksters, so it looks good on paper, but there's there's not really a lot of stuff going on there. And how many millions of Americans are on food stamps now? Oh, yeah, there's no jobs in the United States. Service in the industry is the only thing that happens there. Yeah. Uh, tough right. times. Yeah, well, exactly. This is This is our biggest problem. Um, so we, we've got all this going on and got all the climate change, of course, because, uh, you know, they, they were very quick, weren't they, to say climate change is our fault. Well, right. wouldn't it make you feel a little bit strange if I said that climate change isn't just on Earth? It's happening through the whole solar system. Yeah, some people say that. This is the um, this is a chart going through um, solar activity. And uh, do you remember we were talking about 12,000 BC when we had uh, we had our little blip with the uh, with the sun and the flood? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, if you look at the solar activity there, they've they've um, they've done a chart. Uh, they've had to dig up like earth cores and things to work out how much energy the sun was putting out. But they apparently put this together over um, tens of thousands of years here, and they've they've worked out that the sun is just as angry as it was about 12,000 BC which is a bit awkward because if you're if you're going to play the Nibiru card here Nibiru has got Nemesis which is its sun that it's going around which is creeping into our solar system and what's going to get you more heat second sun's probably going to help isn't it right yeah and look so, at that so if that was related to the original flood like I was saying when it whacked Tiamat or if it came through and knocked out Ceres and created the asteroid belt don't know but either way if, if something big turned up that's looking similar to the last time something really bad happened isn't it yeah so so this Nibiru has his its son following it effectively yeah because um what NASA will tell you is that um, most um, solar systems are actually not singular solar systems. They're binary, which means that you've got a sun and then another sun. So there's two suns. Uh, and effectively, they, they would be known as there'd be two solar systems, but effectively going round each other kind of thing, you know, so they interact with each other. And they're binary solar systems. And they say 80 percent of solar systems are like that. What do you say? Actually, eighty percent is definitely going towards. We could well be, couldn't we? Right. Some people say we have a dark sun. Mm. We have a light sun, and then we have a dark sun just to 
to be consistent with that model. If we've got um, a sun coming in that's got Nibiru going around it, um, it's coming into the solar system and this thing's like a heater. Now, look at what's happened to Venus. See the picture? Right. From 1978, right, where that map of the, the tunnels was coming from in the 70s, look at that, to 1999, we've, we've, got, we've got a couple of decades here and a two and a half thousand percent increase in green light coming off Venus. That's a lot of light, isn't it, coming off it? That's enormous. Right. And then look, rapid appearance of clouds on Mars. <laughs> you know, this, this stuff is weird, isn't it? Yeah. And ozone appearing on Mars. I mean, right. again, I mean, I'm sort of averaging it out here, but we've got a couple of decades here. And then look, 50% erosion of ice features. So Mars well, has got global well, yeah, warming. But but before that, the, the photograph before that was from NASA. Now, NASA has got, uh, isn't just a, an innocent research facility. It's, it's got, uh, it's got to follow up or make way for the, for the normal narrative of the global warming thing. Well, so it could be yeah. concocting all of these things because it's not like NASA doesn't do that. That's what it does for a living. Well, it I mean, concocts it, fiction. Yeah, but why would it say there's global warming on Venus? You know, they're gonna they're gonna tax you for Venus's global warming. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They couldn't. That they screws couldn't, it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah because right. you it, you're it, responsible for global warming. It's your fault. It couldn't. Uh, you're exactly right. It couldn't be uh, taxed. Yeah, but get this though. You see, um, I mean, I've got a telescope that will take these pictures what you're looking at there i can i can take that and you can't hide it i mean if if you're if you're going on about jupiter and what's going on with uh jupiter's uh white ovals um look at them changing i mean J jupiter's got remember that the great big spot on jupiter there's there's a lot of there's a lot of really weird stuff going on saying jupiter has gone up um 18 degrees in 10 years I mean, what would what would happen if that happened to us on Earth? Eighteen degrees in ten years, that would be a problem. Yeah. I mean, that would that would be the end, wouldn't it? Pretty much. And uh, I mean, look at this: towering storms more than a hundred kilometers high, <laughs> hundred kilometer high storms going through Jupiter's cloud deck for the first time. I mean, that's that's pretty severe. I mean. <laughs> You know, that's that's not, right. It's not good to see that happening. And then look at this. This is this is the cue ball. So we've got Uranus here. Now, can you spot any distinctive features on that? Nothing. Looks like a cue ball. That is a cue ball picture. OK, now that's 1986. Now, look what happens to it. And then look, it gets hit by huge storms. And you can see, I mean, these are these are enormous things. Um, and this is all. This is happening all over the place. I mean, the point they're trying to make is they've enhanced the color a little bit on that. They're not really giant red nuclear storms. You know, they've just sort of brought it up a bit so you can see them. But look, a really big changes. Yeah, you know, it's absolutely right. Um, so that that's a bit of a problem. Look at that from 1996 to 2002. It's, it's 40% brighter. That's not yeah, that many they, years now, is it? No, it isn't. It's almost as if that thing's closer to what's coming in and they're getting a lot of changes because they're nearer to it than we are. Right. You see what I mean? Because they're, they're much further out than we are in the, in the system. So if there is something that's out on the edge or it's coming by and it's nearer to them, it, it's doing some pretty horrible things to them because if we've got another sun, here we go, look, 89 to 2002. Look at that, it's just it's gone swirly. <laughs> that's a scientific right. de definition right. it's swirly yeah, it's, it's, um, so we've got more volcanoes going off we're going to have um, there we go economic losses so <laughs> I suppose someone could dig out the insurance files couldn't they and find out how many people have, have lost due to uh, natural disaster or whatever we've got horrible things happening all around the world but I don't believe there's anything you can do to prepare for it I don't think any normal person could really do very much I mean, what are you going to do? Oh, we're not going to do a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's fair, isn't it? <laughs> no, we're not going to do a thing. Um, actually, compared with some other scenarios that could be playing out here, this doesn't sound like it's that bad. 
I mean, you think about world war, nuclear destruction, when you talk about uh, the, the different invasion scenarios that they could be pulling off, uh, total economic collapse. This sounds like, uh, oh, yeah, OK, this is just another one. Yeah. Well, do you know what? If, if, you, if you put it into the Bible, this thing's going to turn up. You'll love this. Remember your alien messiah? Right. Well, um, I'm not sure uh, if, you've, if you've looked into this angle, which is, which is definitely going to make your head spin. Um, this is an ET spaceship, which is the New Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they, they worked it out because, um, you know, the origin of man is, is a little bit fishy, you know. And if you, if you talk to um, a geneticist, um, a guy who, well, who's willing to talk off record, um, he'll, he'll tell you that if you want to say, well, man evolved from a monkey, didn't it? You know, that's the, that's the official story, right? It's the official storyline, that's right. Well, if we evolved from monkeys, why are they still monkeys? Because surely they would have all evolved, right? Right, nobody's evolving into anything, I've noticed. <laughs> well, if we did, we, no. Uh, in fact, we're more stupid than we were before. I mean, we've got no oh, idea how we built the sure. pyramids. Yeah, if anything, we're devolving. <laughs> that's right. So, well, the good news for you, by the way, is um, you're going to have a nice ET spaceship come and get you. So um, we're going to have the New Jerusalem, which is going to show up. Uh, notice the diameter where um, they said, um, uh, my Bible knowledge is not great, but I think they were saying in the Bible that it was 1,300. I'm just reading off the screen here. You can tell I'm cheating. Right. But they said it was the same um, width as it was. It was the same length and width. Okay, um, so they worked out. This is one of the designs. Somebody else says that uh, the New Jerusalem could be a pyramid as well with a square base, um, but um, this one could be this could be like the snow globe kind of version of it, which would work as well. So thirteen twenty five point seven five miles across. Um, so I mean, people can look into this a little bit more, but I mean, how's how's one of those things going to show up? So is is this pushing on the rapture? you know this is the other thing um because you know the <laughs> with all the deception and everything alien messiah and you've got potentially the rapture you've got alien spaceships or a giant ship coming down uh do you get on board what are you gonna do oh i'm not getting on board of anything i so you got <laughs> they've that. got that they've got the false rapture plan that thing it looks like that's that might even be on the breakaway civilization if they wanted to build something like that if it's that big. Well, this, this thing's got, um, like, the edge of it's made of diamond. The idea from it came, came back through a structural engineer, and he said that he had a program that could work out the stress levels of materials. And then somebody just said, like, what's the hardest stuff that you could possibly um, use to make something? And, of course, like, the idea um, was set by somebody else. I think the story went, there was a girl in the room, was, I think she said, well, oh, diamond's pretty hard. And look at that. Because they say it's as clear as glass. Diamonds, pretty solid stuff, and you know we can make diamonds. That's not a problem. We can do that. Uh, you'd have to be some kind of much more advanced civilization to be making uh, one thousand three hundred and twenty-five miles worth of diamond. That's <laughs> that's got to be a big project, right? Yeah. So we could have that thing landing. Now I tell you what, if you've been predicting an alien messiah, that would that would spook most people, wouldn't it? <laughs> that was. That would make them drop to their knees. Yeah, you bet it would. Yeah, that definitely yeah. would. That would be that would be a massive, massive incentive, wouldn't it, to go with the guy who's controlling that thing? They'd be, right. Yeah, they're probably going to have a bit of power there, you know, and they're going to sort things right. out. Yeah. Well, this is this is the thing. If if <laughs> if that turned out to be Luciferian aliens, um, that's that's got to be disappointing, hasn't it, for people thinking they're going to get raptured. <laughs> Right. But we don't know. We're purely speculating. We have no idea. So <laughs> it could be. Um, but this is, this is just a different take on it. Uh, there was a bunch of Jewish rabbis that were meeting, um, and they were actually saying that uh, they thought they were, ha they were in the time of Jacob's troubles. Uh, here we go. I don't know if you can see that. I'll just zoom in a little bit. Jacob's troubles. Earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, violence. Yeah, volcanic look, activity look at the year this is 2000 <laughs> onwards right 
Yeah, this is this is like recent. <laughs> right. We've gotten through some of it. We have. We have. And um we've got um World War Three potentially starting. I mean this is this is what some people in the military have said, haven't they? That in fact World War Three is going on, but it's a stealth war, isn't it? Everyone's got sneaky fighters, but is it really a world war? Are there that are there, are there enough nations involved to call it a world war? Right. I was listening to Alex Jones a couple of weeks ago, and he says that the Pentagon says the World War Three is over, and we're in World War Four. Yeah, I'm not. Are you the Pentagon? Okay, so this says over to the right here. 2015, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you have to be aware when it comes to bad the news. timeline turns red. Yeah, you have to. Oh. Now this is this is September, so we we go into the red zone in September. Then, so this is this is what a lot of people were getting spooked by, thinking it's going to happen now. It's going to happen now. September is the time, but I mean you can't help but have a natural reaction that when it doesn't happen in September, all of this has gone away and none of it's going to happen. Yeah. And you go, oh, right. oh, thank God, it's all gone. There there aren't really any FEMA camps or anything and all the tunnels fell in. Right, <laughs> we're all just, It's all gone, it's all gone. It's, it's all just fear-mongering and we can all just uh, right. go back to what we were doing. Yeah, go back to work, yeah, it's all, relax again, that's it, it's fine. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the problem, you see, because the, 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 twist that, the twist that I'm going through in my mind is that um, all of this is a much slower arcing timeline. I mean, look at, the, look at the years rolling by here on this. I'm looking at the uh, five months, 150 days in the wilderness under his pr protection. That's right. Yeah. So this is um, this is the second coming stuff. So this is uh, so this is <clears throat> Jesus Mark two, or uh, potentially Jesus right. Jesus's brother could be. Um, so Jesus might not return. It might be his brother because uh, Jesus was the first vessel. So there's been a bit of speculation on that one, um, and it's it's going to be a whole different thing because uh, this this guy potentially is is going to be doing some damage. Uh, so this isn't pacifist jesus this is you know this is going to be well let's just call him christ anyway so christ's return that'll, that'll be a good catch-all one um so we're going to the red zone and he should be back so for people predicting second coming i mean this this is it this is um this this is the time so this is uh as far as as far as history goes it's like going to vegas isn't it this is <laughs> this is really the interesting bit um, well, it looks like that. It looks like, according to this, he returns in 2016 around maybe March, maybe April. Could be. Is that what it looks like to you? I mean, I'm. Yeah, I mean, to yeah. People, people have had um, all of these kind of dates floating around, and and let's just let's call these loose dates, okay? Because um, you know how some of these predictions go horribly wrong. Um, usually, always go wrong. Um, <laughs> right. We, but we know for a fact something's brewing. We can't nail it on this, but this is the end times um, view of it. So if we were in the end times, which much of the um, stuff on the internet is declaring, this this would be the hot zone here. So let's let's well, we'll have a quick look through it because um, this is um, uh, the bit where it says um, I, I'm not sure if it says it on this, but it says no man will know the time of day. Because when we get the uh, meteor showers, potentially um, a sunrise will become sunset because it will tilt the Earth. That'll be tricky. Well, so you won't even know what time of day it is because it, it will just throw everything out. So Joshua's long day where he had an extra 12 hours, let's say that happens again. But remember, the solar activity is great flood levels. So could be worse, could be more than 12 hours. But either way, uh, it's saying that whatever happens in this i mean this is again it's it's pretty much speculation i mean but right. if 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 we're going to say no man will know the time of day uh the twist is that uh, relating the bible stuff to the nibiru story that if it comes in and does all that that will fulfill prophecy and that will be absolutely true because if if the time's been thrown off if you got up in the morning and it's suddenly nighttime again i mean you're going to be lost aren't you 
so you won't know the true time of day so i mean going through all of this stuff this this is what uh, gil broussard's done he's he's ticked off loads of these boxes and he said well okay if you are going to be in the end times and you are going to start ticking boxes uh, and saying this is what it all means look at that great tribulation right there three and a half years so they said the time will be halved so instead of another seven years of great tribulation it will be halved to three and a half years be, or no man will survive i think the words go along those kinds that's of lines. right that's exactly right mm. now uh the other thing was um the kissinger story that when he said that israel would be destroyed um i think the year was 2022 that israel will be gone before 2022 and that would be that'd be interesting on this because there's there's some quite unpleasant stuff just slightly before 2022 notice armageddon uh, that's coming in end of 2020 according to this uh and also got uh, new jerusalem so <laughs> so so right it's it gets plenty of time for an et messiah and all those things to work out this is like uh, really interesting times coming up if you can figure out some way to survive it well if it comes to if, if it comes to this and this thing is coming in oh yeah you're gonna have you're gonna have a whole lot of trouble i mean you're gonna have three and a half years of trouble right and uh they're saying a place of safety in the wilderness and they're talking about uh all the rich uh people um well just about everybody you can get anywhere going underground so underground is the place to be uh cause you certainly don't want to be out in the open and you also well you're gonna need you need a lot of supplies right if you start looking at what's going on in the world i mean what else could cause this what else would make people dig holes under the entire united states is 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 a third world war going to be that bad that you need to excavate that much right the people that might know what's going on are going underground so there's got to be something that's causing that and they're making sure that their minions that'll be left on the surface can survive long enough to keep them safe down there. You know, I think another thing that we should throw into this mix, we were talking about the Queen temporarily vacating uh, Buckingham Palace. That's right. And when, when she's choosing to do that, when she's leaving in March and she's coming back in the fall or something? I, I think it was, um, I think it's the end of this year, actually. They, they said Buckingham Palace needs to have renovation work and the queen just can't be there and i think it will get her out of there um through this time period definitely i mean it's it's all a bit awkward and i, I heard that she'd got some land in colorado denver colorado um and if that's true that's where the government suddenly moved to because did you know the government moved off the east coast yeah, absolutely they moved everything uh cia headquarters fbi they're all they're all located in Colorado, mm. probably underground in Colorado. Well, yeah, definitely, because they've got a they've got an underground military base right under the airport, haven't they? They sure do. Yeah, and, and here's, we're looking at the timeline here. Um, so this is um, this is potentially um, the kind of speed this thing's going to be coming in. And if you look there, can you see the the big yellow twenty sixteen? Right so let's let's get into the hot spot here so so this is this is saying that um as we come through november and december um this is going to be like venus kind of brightness so this is going to be the giveaway so let's just say that the timing's wrong on this one it might not be around march but this would be what to look for and this would be the amount of time you would have left until you start getting problems so if you say that we've got an equal brightness to Venus, I think that's safe to say amateur astronomers are going to start getting it, aren't they? Right, that's what it says. This is when the Chinese astronomers first saw the guest star. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we could even tack a few months onto that there and say that they, they got it out at about, um, about the July kind of level. Right. Can we assume that we had better telescopes than they did in China? Yeah, which is which is why I'm thinking that our March date probably isn't going to happen. I say probably, meaning definitely. <laughs> probably, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and so, I, I so think we, we've got all the events happening, and everyone's been building up, but they've been digging holes since '78, haven't they? Well, they've, 
I had a lot before, to say. Before, yeah. Yeah, even before then. I'm, I'm guessing that this isn't exactly going to be hidden knowledge from the top people round in the major nations. I think they're going to be, they're all in on it, aren't they? Um, if, if this is a massive conspiracy and they all know that something's going to happen, I mean, we've got the underground stuff that's happened in Russia. We've got military movement all over the place. We've got Chinese cities hanging around with nobody in them that can house 30 million people because they said that there could potentially be a 600 foot wave like a giant tsunami. Um, and was it? I think it was higher than that, actually. There's a giant tsunami that's going to take out the east coast of the states. Um and uh, if that was the case, you'd want to be on high ground, which is why Colorado is a top place to be. The Chinese cities they've built are on high ground. I mean, this is this is all going back to the previous stories that have been floating around about all these odd places in the world where you've got safe havens underground, you've got bunkers for the elite, you've got places high up which can house millions of people around the world. It's just all a bit peculiar. Um, but, I mean, my money still... Is is on a? It's going to be another miss for Nibiru in March. I think. I, I just. I can't imagine that. We would have seen it. I'm sure we would. Look at December. We've got the faintest stars visible in an urban neighbourhood with the naked eye. That's three months, isn't it? Just about. If we're in between December and January. Yeah. Yeah. And that that was seen and it was observed. And we've got. Um, we look at all the different places that spotted this thing. Well, yeah, they were seeing it for more than six months. Yeah, surely you'd think surely we would have seen it. So I think I think it would be safe to say we should be able to call out March. But yeah, no, they saw it. If this is the same object, we can't really we can't really say it's dark and it's hidden and it's infrared and nobody can see it because if this is the same object, they got it, didn't they? Right, and well, and look at look yeah. at the places it's seen, all over Rome, Baghdad. Yeah, Beijing, because we we've got all this odd stuff. We've got people who've seen something like this before, and we're assuming that these these stories are linked. But if that's the case, it's got to be six months, hasn't it? Right, but you are working a lot of on a lot of concrete evidence, even though you don't have the planet. You have historical. Well, we can call it historical data. I mean, because it's in it's in artwork. It's in it's in. Uh, uh, descriptions and uh, then we have all the, the suspicious moves that are going on in the planet building cities building underground cities moving to the I mean we have a lot of activity that looks like they're planning on having something come in do you, do you remember the um, the phantom time hypothesis no I don't remember that one Rich well this would be interesting um, well, they said from this is this picture has got nothing to do with Phantom Time, but I thought it'd be interesting to put on anyway because it, it is a uh, it is the Mayan calendar. Do you remember the 2012 end of everything? Oh, right. Yeah, that was a face palm, wasn't it? Is the end of the world? Oh no, ah, it's terrible. Well, get this. Um, in between, uh, there, there's a there's a hypothesis going around between the years 600 and 900 AD that those 300 years are actually missing, that somebody messed with the calendars and threw us forward because an emperor just wanted to live later. And there was some weird story behind it. I can't remember, but you should go and look it up. There is a phantom time hypothesis, and people have spent quite some time on this and saying that the Dark Ages, actually, history was fabricated and they didn't really happen. Now, that would be a real problem because that would mean we haven't got to the end of the Mayan calendar yet. It's not 2012. We're in the year 1700 and something. Right. <laughs> well, you know, a while back, um, when the, the, during the fall, I think I've told you this before, during the fall of the Soviet Union, the teachers, during the Soviet Union, the teachers were told absolutely what they had to teach. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, in Russia, they decided to only teach what was real and so they hired a group of mathematicians and scholars and they wrote a series of books called history fiction or science which i got the first volume and uh, it's amazing they go through one thing after another and one of the things was this gregorian calendar they claimed through their research and what they did is they took different documents 
and documents back then would have different uh, astrological placements on them. So they could date these documents precisely and not use the date that was on the document, if you know what I mean. Mm. So, mm. And also paintings, uh, different things that were depicted in paintings. And they could more accurately get a timeline. Well, they discovered, they or they say definitively that uh, if Jesus came, he came only 1,000 years ago, and that Judaism started 200 years before that, and that the Mayan, uh, the Gregorian calendar set everything up, created the Middle Ages, created all these, these different uh, things that we call history. And also, when Pope Gregory was there, they had access to the Mayan calendar, so they could reset the Mayan calendar to coincide with whatever dates they were creating now. So the whole thing absolutely could be a hoax. Mm -hmm. Our whole history, the way we know it, could be fabricated to create the end time scenario to serve the purpose of whoever's purpose it's serving. Well, what do you think? Yeah, well, yeah. There, there was a story as well um, talking about the 300 years. If that was true and we, we'd lost 300 years, there was a story of a guy um, who um, it, it was a bit of an out of body experience, you know, like an Edgar Casey almost, you know, because he predicted the future. But this guy actually traveled um, to his reincarnated self in the year 3900. Um, and uh, he had all of history explained to him. Um, and the end times, according to his account, happened uh, 300 years from now. So this was the year 2300. And uh, if anyone's still alive or listening to this or still cares in 100 years' time, apparently we'll land on Mars in the year 2200. Um, so the end times come in the year 2300 when population of the Earth has, has got so high because it doesn't look like it's going to stop growing, does it? Um and we're no. gonna, we're going we're gonna to hit the limit where we have food shortages and the, these are the end time prophecies coming in saying there's going to be a problem with food and everything's going to go wrong uh, we're going to get the the war coming and everything and you know th this is this was described to this guy um, as the year 2300 or thereabouts so I can't remember the exact <laughs> dates but it's about 300 years away I don't care because I won't be there for it unless I well 300 it. years away that would coincide with the next returning. Well, look at this. This is the Mayan calendar. Do you see those things all around the edge? Yeah. Do you remember the original, uh, the paintings that we saw, which looked a bit yeah, like that? Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Look at that. That's amazing. Now, that, that's creepy, isn't it? Because if that's showing every time it's come round, this, this is a regular, isn't it? Right. Yeah, you know, the minds the minds have got this in a few times. Um so if this is coming round and um, look at the top one, I mean, there's <laughs> something meaner at the top. So I don't know if if we've if we've got if we've got 300 missing years and it throws this back to 2300. Maybe the 2012 stuff was all just to blow it off because in 300 years, are you going to be looking back at the Mayan calendar? I mean, that's ancient history and it never happened, did it? Didn't no, it didn't. No, the Mayan calendar was a huge miss. It wasn't the end of the world. I mean, it could have just said it's the end of an era and there'll be a new era. But if we're all running out because all all our calendars are wrong, I mean that that just throws everything out, doesn't it? I mean, even trying to cor right. correlate in history, it, it's it's tricky. But you know, if we if we've got some decent accounts of bits of history that haven't been messed with, and we're only talking a few hundred years back, and this thing this thing is the same object as we saw only a few hundred years ago, well, we we could have a problem, but we just we just don't know, do we? There's evidence scattered everywhere, but it's thin, isn't it? Right, exactly. It's it's all and guesswork. Well, well, and the most interesting thing is we don't really have any pictures of this. There's a lot of activities going on that looks like they're expecting something horrendous yeah. to happen. And not, and not just things caused by the control system, you know, like the hippie movement in World War II and stuff. That these things that are coming in 
they couldn't even be orchestrated. They couldn't even be uh, uh, feigned by the uh, control system. They have to be definitely uh, from an external source. Do you think we could say that? Well, if, if you wanted to throw in some geoengineering, uh, that, that makes things iffy when you're making the, the land and the sky into a war zone because we've got HARP, haven't we? Right. We have HARP, and they are popping off probably volcanoes and earthquakes that wouldn't be popping off, and they are creating weather events. I mean, the California drought has been shown to be a, a HARP intervention, and... Uh, you know, they're doing those kind of things and they are um, building under, they are the ones that are building the underground bases. Yeah. And if you if you think, if you were planning a harp war with other nations that have the same technology, you know who's going to suffer the most. It's going to be people on top side, isn't it? Right. But I don't think we can, I don't think we can take this story and we can throw it away and we can say, well, it didn't happen in 2000, 2003, I think was one of the times it was meant to happen. Uh, it just keeps coming back. The Nibiru story is always there and people are like, nah, this is pure fabrication. This is made right. of crap. This is, it's just not going to happen. And at the moment, I can't say that I've seen anything that would mean that it is going to happen. Um, we've been told it's behind the sun. It's hiding somewhere, you know. There's always some kind of reason why we can't see it. Um, but when it does pop up, um, I think at the, at the very least we'll have 40 days notice on it. But I think this is one of those stories that you can kind of tuck away in your top drawer and just go, hmm... It's it's not going to kill me, but I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna entirely bin this story because there's some there's some strange stuff going on and people have seen something that looks awful like this before, even if it isn't Planet X. There's something swinging around every 350 years that's causing a lot of trouble, and we're about due for another one. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but there's there's something out there, and you know I think it would I think it would be a good idea to keep an eye out for it, don't you? Yeah, I think that's that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to frame it. Don't discount it, but also don't uh, don't build a, uh, a two mile deep shelter under your home because you're worried about Nibiru. Yeah, just, um, just get good at stealing other people's bunkers because uh, right, something's right. going down and you can't afford what they've got. <laughs> that's right. But and when you superimpose the, the uh, Bible prophecies on top, now the Bible prophecies. Uh, granted, they can, they, you know, there's a lot of latitude, a lot of ways to interpret those. But they do seem to fit pretty nicely over this return of the beer. They? I think that's another thing it's safe to say, that there are bad things happening, and uh, it's, it's bound to get worse unless more and more of us wake up and realize that a lot of it's being done to us by people who have technology that are, it's even beyond our conceptualization. There's probably a lot we could do if we were all awake and aware of what's being done to us now. Yeah, I think whatever it is that's going to happen, I think the way that we're going to survive is certainly together. And I think if you're on your own, you're not going to make it. Whatever's going to happen. Right. I think that's really a great way to end our discussion, Richard. That we can, We're going to have a lot better chance of making it if we're awake and we're together and not waking up to what's going on. Well, thank you very much, Richard. This has been uh, more than fascinating. I've, I've sat here for as long as we were talking with my mouth half open because I've been amazed. And uh, thank you very much for spending time with us. Always good to be here. Well, I'll say one thing. Richard always takes us on a wild ride. I mean, this one included the Biru, New Jerusalem, World War III, and he even got into Bible prophecy. But to summarize, what did we really learn? Well, we know that we could find this new planet, Eris. It's not really a planet, it's kind of a dwarf planet X. But we couldn't find Nibiru. Can't find any evidence of it or its uh, sun, Nemesis. No professional or amateur uh, astronomers have any pictures at all. What about the Anunnaki? They came from Nibiru, right? 
Well, I don't think anybody ever said that they came from Liberia. We were just kind of connecting them together. All we know is they came from, from, from the sky. They came from heaven. They might be the fallen angels. Who knows? And so what about the prophetic end of the world? And the New Jerusalem? Is it going to be on a spaceship? Is the New Jerusalem the city that we're all seeing over China now? What's going on here? You know, probably the best evidence we have to try to figure out what's going on here is actually no evidence that fits together unless you look at a big, broad picture. I mean, you've got Dr. Harrington, who came forward and did all this research and all of a sudden was summarily done away with. And now there's astronomers in Paris that are being killed. I mean, you have to look at what the, what the elite are doing now. They're building underground bases that we know about. We know that they're going to hide ground. They know that they're all uh, consolidating their food banks. You know, all these things fit together. And what about the murals in the Denver airport predicting the end of the world, some cataclysmic thing from the sky that might come in? Who knows? And then there's the changes that are taking place all through the solar system, including heating up. And if you look around the planet, maybe geoengineering, but there are major increase in volcanoes and plate tectonics activity like earthquakes happening all over the world. And they're still looking for something out there. And they're building in Chile a huge telescope called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And it's on a mountain in Chile to look for whatever it is they know is out there and they think it's coming. But after speculating on this subject for a while and talking about Nibiru and what could be happening in the Bible prophecies, we came to a couple conclusions. Likely 2016 won't be the end of the world, or maybe 2017 might not be the end of the world, especially if it has to be caused by Nibiru, because there's just no evidence that it's getting in here. Uh, number two, we might not be able to control what's in the outside world or what what the galaxies or the universe or whatever out there is is coming to get us. But we can control our situation here on Earth. And the way we control the situation here on Earth is by waking up to what's going on, by waking up and finding out who our enemy is and how we can protect ourselves and create a nice foundation for human beings to go forward in the future. That's what we should be focusing on and not focusing on things over which we have absolutely no control. And another thing that Richard and I speculated on as we were going through this, this group of material is that they seem to be wanting to get underground. The elites seem to want to bury themselves or go to high ground or get away. They seem to want to hide from something. And we were speculating that one thing that they might be wanting to hide from is us. Because we're waking up we're finding out who they are and what they're doing. And you know, their judgment is way overdue. So let me leave you on that note. Take control of what we can control. Don't worry about what you, can, you, don't, you can't control. And focus on the positive aspect of this moving underground by the elites. They might be needing to get away from us because we're waking up and we realize that we don't need them. And quite the opposite. We need to be without them. Well, that's all the World Beyond Belief for today. God bless you and take care. Hello YouTube newsletter subscribers, this is Terrell from Terrell03.com and I received an interesting email and I want to make a video response to it and um, this is information on Kyle Kaplan, the Texas EDU guy, Department of Astronomy. Looking at his video right here and I've stopped it where he's given the right ascension and the declination values right here and I'm using Stellarium to look to where he says this object is which 
I've already turned away from his location. It's uh, uh I'm not going to be I'm not going to be able to find it. But anyway, it's around here on the north end. And this is in his neighborhood. And I believe where he says the object is is very near this location. You see we have 4 hours. We have on the ascension we have about 60 degrees over here. This is far far above the plane and way too high. The object that we're actually going to be looking for is going to be very much near the plane. And if you think about it, a peripheral dwarf which is a dwarf star that's created with our solar system is going to be very near the plane. It's going to have a relative to the Sun very near a zero zero declination and that's going to change with the Earth as it's tilting back and forth at 23 and a half degrees where I place our object is actually going to be about right here in the Libra constellation 15 hours and about a negative 16 declination right now and the, the problem with this with this explanation that this is really where Nibiru is, well, something this high above the plane is never going to create a seismic pattern. So when you get into Bible prophecy, for example, and the birth pangs that are in the earthquakes, the signs that Jesus Christ gives, the earthquakes, the volcanism, the tsunamis, and things like that, then yes, those are symptoms of a binary twin to our sun that is interacting with the inner solar system or a peripheral dwarf. And my view early on in the investigation a couple of years ago was that we were de dealing with a peripheral dwarf. Now I've come to realize looking at the historical precedent that we're dealing with a binary twin to our sun and this cannot possibly be anywhere in the neighborhood of what we're talking about. And the reasons are, um, let me see what I could pull up for you really fast to show you. That would be newsletter number 44 from 2013. Let me see if I can pull that up for you real fast, which I think I can. Okay, this is from number 44. Here's a little note for Sheldon. Instead of having this auto, uh, do your own adjustment. that makes everything clear up for you. This is my Black Star event timeline showing events for 2013, and which is a condensed version of what has been going on. But whenever you look at the seismic pattern, then in 2010, this object was in Leo. And when Japan happened, then this object was between Leo and Virgo. And you see how that now we're, we're in Virgo. We were in Virgo in 2012. And this object is, see, notice how these pie shapes are getting larger and larger, right? Well, the next predicted event is for May the 17th, 2014. That's whenever I expect a crossing event to take place. But the seismic pattern, this is the scientific data that says that there's something out there. We've got backside alignment events also and lots of other indicators. This is just the seismic pattern that I'm showing you. But for example, whenever where I'm holding my cursor right here, right here, this is in, in uh, 2012. This object, we were coming up on this Guerrero event. This is when the magnetosphere flipped around, March 12th and 13th, 2012. That says that the object was on the the uh, entering side of the Virgo constellation. So that's just another bit of evidence that tells us where this thing was. And this thing must be very near the equator of the sun in order to create a seismic pattern. So the scientific evidence is going to disprove what this fellow is saying. Although I believe he's looking at something, actually, the uh, the the, the uh, Skyview team, the Kuiper Belt object guys, I think they might be looking at the same thing. Another problem that I have is this fellow is apparently not using infrared or any other anything else. He's he's showing all these different you know these objects out in space. That could be that could be anything. And Don, the astronomer that I'm working with, he has his own observatory. He's been looking at the area of space where this guy's at, which the observation window is not open now. We are just now making the 90 degree angle to be able to open up the observation window into where I'm trying to look in the Libra constellation. 
So nobody can go out there with a telescope and look at it right now, not a ground-based telescope. That opportunity is opening up for soon, but it's just not there yet. But whenever it is, we're going to be looking at it with infrared equipment, and we're not going to be able to see it. We haven't been able to see it on previous orbit cycles. The, uh, the use of astronomers and telescopes, it depends so much on the technology. We're dealing with an anomalous object that you can't see, which is the reason I'm having to track it through the Earth changes, magnetic pole migration, through the mass animal deaths, when they're happening, when's the seismic low in the indicator quakes. That's going to be 90 degree angle from, let me get back over here to this newsletter. You see, when you draw a 90 degree line, from the these are alignments this is what's happening on the alignment notice the colors so if I have an alignment in green on the front side that bends around because we have to add days because this object is moving faster and faster left in the orbit diagram from our perspective okay but when I draw 90 degree lines out I'm finding outside orbit position in other words where earth comes into alignment on the back side and then a little over 90 days later we're going to outside orbit position representing the seismic low so that is clearly identifiable, very predictable. We're coming to the seismic low right now around February the 1st. Okay, so now the uptick period begins and we start this whole cycle again. And rather than Iran on 4-9 last year, we're going to be adding more than a month. Where back here, whenever in 2010, I was only having to add 11 days to find my next event. This Japan event I predicted for 315 happened on 311. I was a little bit off, but my, my estimates are getting closer and closer now. I'm understanding more and more about what's happening here. And um, this predicted date, I do not know if the black star is here. I don't know that it's going to cross Earth orbit path, but that's what the indicators are saying. And I'm just being true and honest to the research, looking at the data and making projections based on that. Hopefully it's wrong hopefully there's a super wave or I'm, I'm you know the video I made yesterday about the super wave right it's possible that I am looking at the symptoms of the super wave it's possible their convergence date is May of 2014 just like mine okay which makes me suspicious but it's possible because I'm tracking symptoms and not actually looking at an object. It's possible that it is a super wave that that I'm looking at, and the but the convergence date is May of 2014 based on the science. Okay, what now? What I'm going to do is I'm going to send an email to this fella. In see, this is one of my um, newsletter subscribers, Mark, and he's giving me the information here on the email address, so I can actually write the fella and. I'm going to share my information with him. Not that he can use his telescope because the observation window is not open yet. But what I would want to do is share the information on the seismic pattern and other things and then give him a general location of where the seismic pattern is actually coming from, where the distortion is coming from, because it is definitely not. There's no seismic pattern associated with the, the coordinates that this fellow is sharing. It's just not happening not happening that way so I wanted to make a little report and I will add this to the newsletter volume number five that's what I'm working on right now that's this uh, volume number five newsletter this is kinda how it go comes together is throughout the week I'm given uh, Zetter Girl sent in a nice article on this uh, rocket stove mass heater which is really cool and uh, the Candida stuff I'm gonna continue on so these articles come across my desk in what's what the good stuff is going into the newsletter each week and so I did write a comment under this video that I'll share with you seeing that I have have some more time left so this is my comment the information from the video appears incorrect I list the coordinates and I list the constellation and it's too far, way too far above the ecliptic plane to even be considered this is going to be more like a uh, orc cloud object similar to S1. It had a 62 degree inclination to the plane. And this object here has a high inclination also. It's more of an orc cloud type object rather than a, uh, an object that was formed on the same plane on the, from the same dust cloud. So um, I make that point. I say my investigation now in the fourth year places the inbound 
towards star in the Libra constellation with Saturn leading and Mars following. So it's in between Saturn and Mars. And I give the coordinates 15 hours, uh, 7 minutes, and about 15 degrees. I'm sorry, about negative 16 degrees uh, below the celestial plane. Remember the celestial plane is diving back and forth at 23 and a half degrees while the, the ecliptic plane of the sun is in relation and relatively is flat. So that the black star, the declination to the sun is not going to change like it does on the Earth because we're tipping back and forth. So I give the evidence that this object, or a, the conclusion from the evidence, that this object moved through the Leo beginning in 2008, 2011, transitioned over to Virgo, and it's now accelerating. It's now in the Libra constellation. Remember that Nibiru means planet of crossing. And what I'm looking at is apparently a crossing event, May of 2014, the third week in May, actually. And um, yeah, and I give the notion that I state that the notion of the astronomer's object is in the outer boundary of the solar system now and will come into near proximity to the Earth in August. That's physically impossible. We're talking about an object that is beyond 50 astronomical units. It's beyond the Kuiper belt. And if it's entering, that's what he's saying. That's the same words that McKinney uses, that this thing is out there somewhere. It's on the periphery of the solar system. But it's going to interact with us as a mini solar system and stuff like that. So I see components of my investigation, a thread running through these different researchers. But uh, the common denominator is that your object must fit th the evidence. And it's, it's, this is just like a, uh, a murder mystery that we're tracking down a suspect. And we, there's evidence. And the evidence points in a direction. And that direction right now is in the Libra constellation. Out of 88 constellations, it's in the Libra constellation. That is a guarantee. Now, this thing can only move so far left in the orbit diagram before it crosses Earth orbit path if it's a crossing object, if it's going to cross Earth orbit path. Once we get beyond July the 7th, then the Earth moves around in orbit so far that it's impossible for the object to cross Earth orbit path. It would cross beyond Earth orbit path. It would cross Mars orbit path still, but not Earth orbit path. So we're looking at a date of a crossing that is, my view, before June and in late May. That's whenever, now that's what I'm afraid of. But remember, we're dealing with an anomalous object. It's possible that I'm missing something. It's possible. And so I'm, I'm leaving the door open. I'm just warning people that this is what the science is saying to me right now. And if somebody can send me something to the contrary, then I'm happy to look at it and to make revisions. This, there's nothing written in stone here. One of the reasons that my book hasn't been written is because I can't draw definitive conclusions yet. And if hindsight is required to draw those conclusions, the book is never going to be written. So I'm having to warn you guys through these newsletter updates and things like that why I'm gathering the data for my next book. And um, you see what I mean? So I'm stuck in between a rock and a hard place. So anyway, I'll share all the information down below and um, give you guys the opportunity to write this fella too. And I'm interested to see what he says when he comes back because this seems to be a tongue-in-cheek deal. It seems to be a little bit too scripted, a little bit too much humor, a little bit, you know, it just seems a little bit cockeyed to me, um, to be real. But, um, you know, they're, they're sharing the same conclusion that I am, that Nibiru, Planet X, Hercolobus thingy from history is coming around again for another Earth encounter. And so that's pretty much my update. And I again, I will add this to the newsletter, this video with the others. And... I will see you guys on the next video. Talk to you later.
this report that I was just watching. It says that these are being reported all over the United States. Not really getting good color there. It goes from like blue to reddish orange to yellow. Now, I knew this was going to happen. I knew we were going to start seeing crazy meteor showers on account of last year when Elenin, extinction level event Nin, aka Nibiru, the, uh, the winged planet, when it flew through our solar system, this is what it looked like. And um, it's a different characteristic of the sky, and you're also looking at a bunch of space there but you can see that it goes from like yeah uh, this is more greenish but you know the the sky looks like it was kind of green to like reddish orange to yellow so whatever this thing is made of that's what's uh these meteors right now i'm gonna start this back at the beginning to show you how far off this is that's a really good zoom in that's it right there so I mean it is way out there it is way out there in sp well it was way out there in space uh, they say that this video was taken in August August 27th of 2011 That's it. So, uh, I don't know, the, the Earth is going around the sun like this, right? And this was way out there in space in August. And you know, this, uh, these fireballs, they're apparently kicking off whatever this thing is made of. You know, it's just, you know, whatever it's made of is just flying, being kicked out into space. And... Where where that stuff would then have been orbiting the sun, yeah, you know, however many months away from the Earth this was when uh, when when that fireball yeah when the fireball occurred, we're flying through it now. Yeah, I don't know how much worse the meteor fireballs are going to get. The report that put me onto this though, uh, he didn't just say that there were fireballs, these things. Uh, this is the report right here from Idaho Picker. Fireball reports coming in from across the nation. And uh, he says he saw one of these himself. He's, uh, personally, he saw one of these in the sky. Uh, this isn't the picture that he took, this is a picture somebody else took, but he says that this is exactly what he saw. Uh, he reports also though that um, there have been 11 explosions in Louisiana just in the past day. And I was out there searching the internet trying to find the explosions in Louisiana, but I couldn't find them. I don't know, you know, obviously with the media being in control of three corporations you know that they're um, you know this is the type of stuff that they black out you know when it is that you know they're hoping people are gonna get murdered by it you know so nobody will do you know what's necessary to survive it but yeah I don't know just uh, more crazy times we're living in you know, Nibiru fireballs falling from the sky
what I did in the 12th planet, and maybe that is the reason for its uh, success and for its uh, still being so uh, uh, powerfully around, is that I brought to life a civilization that was hardly known before. Uh, and that is the Sumerian civilization. <laughs> so I brought to life uh, the Sumerian civilization, <laughs> which was really a most amazing civilization. It uh, blossomed out in what is now southern Iraq. <laughs> so about 6,000 years ago, <laughs> an incredible civilization appeared there, and all those that deal with it use such words as uh, suddenly, unexpectedly, out of nowhere, because there was no gradual or any kind of uh, precedential civilization that, that you had this and this and this and this is, was a, a, a higher level, a higher stage. Suddenly, from what we may call primitive, though they were not primitive people, <coughs> but you know, they were uh, farmers, hunters, uh, etc. But suddenly there appeared cities, uh, high rise buildings, uh, organi societal organization, kings, priests, um, um, codes of law. Uh, literature, art, music, musical instruments, all of that within <coughs> a very short uh, uh, period, appeared about 6,000 years ago. But I want to uh, mention tonight <coughs> at least three of, three of their first. One is writing. <coughs> they <coughs> developed a writing system called cuneiform, we were described using a, um, a stylus would make wedge-like uh, symbols or indentations in wet clay, which when it dried uh, would uh, become a permanent record. But uh, let's say that this is a uh, clay tablet, and I once uh, <coughs> held up a copy of my book, not this one, this is a DVD, and I said, uh, wh which one of the two do you think would last another thousand years? The printed book or the clay tablet? And the answer is the clay tablet. <laughs> so we have uh, writing, which of course meant uh, a language and grammar and literature and, and epic tales and lullabies were written down, recipes. So writing was one of them. Another thing was pictorial depictions. They uh, took uh, uh, stones, mostly semi-precious stones, and made cylinders about an inch or so, sometimes longer, but basically about an inch, a cylinder of an inch, and would engrave, and nobody has figured out to this day how, in this hard stone, they would make an engraving in reverse, like a negative, which when rolled on wet clay, would become a permanent Egypt, a permanent <coughs> uh, depiction, the way we uh, say print, print our presses, the rotary uh, precious now, the newspapers. And uh, the third thing that uh, uh, I would like to uh, mention and, and, and stress uh, this evening was the uh, high-rise buildings. Uh, they uh, were the first to use bricks and to build high-rise buildings, uh, st like stage pyramids that would rise 100, 120, 160, or more feet <coughs> high. Uh, some uh, think that uh, these were the Towers of Babel, uh, mentioned in the Bible. Actually, it's not so, but uh, every major city, Sumerian city, 
had a sacred precinct, and the sacred precinct had such a <coughs> uh, ziggurat, as they were called. And they were used primarily uh, for uh, uh, astronomical observation. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, their knowledge of astronomy, or in the field of astronomy, is one of the most amazing uh, Sumerian legacies. <clears throat> this is, for example, the imprint of a cylinder seal. You can actually see the seal uh, in Jerusalem. There's a museum there called uh, Bible Lens Museum. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is, uh, if you ask a, uh, <laughs> a regular scholar, uh, what, what is it, they'll show it. You'll say this is a beer drinking scene <laughs> because uh, uh, the Sumerians were also the first to invent beer. Uh, and drinking beer was a social event, and you can see people are coming to participate in that, and beer was drunk through a straw, uh, the way I understand in, say, in Latin America or in Argentina, they drink uh, mate, mate tea uh, with, with, with a straw. <laughs> but as many other cylinder seals, uh, they were decorated with celestial symbols. And if you study this one, uh, you find out that uh, it depicts the sun, it depicts the earth and its moon, it depicts what we call the asteroid belt, which is a belt orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and nobody knows, or nobody, I mean, I say nobody because I do. <laughs> Others claim they don't know how it came about. It's the remains of some planet that uh, was destroyed, exploded, except that if a planet explodes, the pieces fly in all directions, and in this case, <laughs> they orbit like a belt between Mars and Jupiter. So you also have Mars and Jupiter, uh, here's Jupiter. You have the asteroid belt, which we have discovered only in modern times. And beyond Jupiter, you have Saturn and its rings, uh, which we uh, did not know about until the invention of the telescope. Now this cylinder seal is from about 2000 BC, from 4000 years ago. So this is an example of the amazing uh, Sumerian uh, knowledge in astronomy. <clears throat> but there is even m one more amazing cylinder seal, uh, which uh, caused uh, quite uh, an uproar at the museum where it's kept. It's, it's in a museum in Berlin at the time <coughs> when I uh, came across <coughs> its existence. It was East Berlin, uh, but they cooperated with me. They sent me a photograph. And uh, if you ask uh, uh, scholars what, <coughs> what is the scene depicted, they say, well, this is the god of agriculture granting the plow, a primitive plow, to mankind. A representative of mankind is introduced by a lesser god to the main god who grants the, the, the plow. And uh, just as an aside, I'll say so, you tell those same uh, scholars at the museum or in, in any of their <coughs> scientific magazines say, so there was a god of agriculture and that's how you look. They say, no, no, that's, that's a mythological scene. That's just mythology. But whatever it is, there is an interesting celestial depiction on this one, and 